everybody, Stephen Key here with patent attorney Damon Callie. We're gonna talk about how to protect your creativity and hopefully save you some money, right, Damon? I mean, this I, is I not- I hope so. I hope so, but more than that, give you the confidence to move forward with your creativity. Um, so I wanna talk about, you're gonna love this, let's talk about how do you find the right attorney? See, Damon, I think ah. you're the right attorney. Well, okay. the, then the answer is just give me a call. That's, okay. that's how that there, works. Okay, I guess we can just <laughs> shut this one down. Let me, let, me, let me turn this off. You guys, you know what's important, and Damon, help people understand this. Does it matter where you live? No. I mean, could I, could I, if I, if I live back in Florida and you're in California, is it, is it the same? Can I call you up and you can help me? No problems. Yeah, you can. I'm, uh, patent attorneys are barred uh, at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is federally controlled. So we operate at the federal level, which means we can operate in any state, including Guam and Puerto Rico. Nice. So if okay. you're in Puerto Rico or Guam, give me a call. All right. Here's another question. You know, people are out there. I've been told if you're going to find a patent attorney, read some of their patents. Because if you can't understand them, find somebody else. Is that true or not? Well, I mean, that, I, I may have been one of the guys that told you that because honestly, when I started this profession, I, the first patent I read, I, I started reading this thing in my, my new office and I fell asleep. I, did, I literally fell asleep at the desk and I, I woke up maybe 10 minutes later. I thought, geez, what happened? And so I started reading again and I fell asleep again. It was horrible. And it was just <laughs> work to try to get through that. I decided right then that I was gonna write patents that people could actually read and understand and maybe try to remove some of the mystery around it. So, I, yeah, I think that's true. I think if you can't understand what your patent attorney re, uh, writes, then I, I don't see the point. Okay, because you, you're right. Um, some of these patents I've read, if you really wanna to go to bed at night, just read a, oh, read a, read a patent, okay? They're put you awful. Sleep every time. But here's a question I have. Um, do some of these attorneys write them in such a way that no one can understand it? Is that a strategy or not? <laughs> I don't think it is. I think, I think there's two thing, issues kind of going on here. One is that there are terms of art in the patent field, which means that there are words that have meaning. And so we're very careful how we use our words in the, pro, in the, in the right way. So sometimes that can seem you know, a little arcane. The second thing that happens is there's a lot of repetition in patents. You know, if we, if we show a part in a different view, we simply repeat a lot of the language that we used previously so that it, it reads consistently throughout the patent. The third thing is that the patent itself should mirror the claims to some extent. And if you've ever read a claim, you'll know that you have no idea what it does the first time you read it. You read through it and you think, wow, who thought of that? But that's, you know, 150, 200 years of patent law Okay. All distilled down into one place. So that's what makes it hard to read. Okay. So it doesn't matter where I live. You got to make sure you have a, a patent attorney that, that can actually write so you can write well so you can actually understand it. How important is it to, to find a patent attorney that specializes? I mean, if, I'm, if I've got a medical device, let's say, and do I need to find a patent attorney that just specializes in that field? I... Yes and no. Uh, I mean, there are, there are guys that do mechanical that could do a medical device and they could do a competent job. The problem is when you get into the, to arguing with the examiner and you kind of know the art. If you know the art, then you're better equipped to handle that, that period of time with the examiner. So if it's a critical device, I would go with a guy that, that had experience in mechanical devices. However, having said that, I do a lot of consumer products in a lot of different areas, and I'm very comfortable with consumer products, although that spreads across a wider spectrum, and most patent attorneys are required to do more than one field. So you'll typically okay. find a guy that can do two or three different kinds of fields. For example, okay. I don't do any electronics. I don't do any at all. That's black okay. art science. <laughs> okay, I've got another one here for you. All right. Um, software, okay, come on. The laws are changing, the winds are blowing differently all the time at the USPTO. That's a pretty tricky thing. Do, you, do I need to get someone specialized in that? Or can, yeah. can, okay. Yes, that's a definite yes, that's one of those. I, I would say software, I would say chemical, like uh, genetic stuff, you gotta get a, 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 an expert. Uh, electronic components, you gotta get an expert. Uh, kind of the mechanical stuff, 
lots of different people or consumer products, a lot of different guys can do that. But software changing so much, there's so much law. We could spend seven segments on this and bore your listeners to tears with the kind of stuff that's kind of going on right now. So yeah, okay. really changing fast. Okay, so when it comes to consumer products, that's your field, you can ace that in a heartbeat. Yeah, I do that. Okay, perfect. Love it. You guys, so here's the message here. Look at what you have, really simple. If, it's, if you need someone that's really specialized, then you, know, you find that person. And it doesn't matter where you live, you can pick, pick, pick and choose, whatever. Damon, should I pick a big firm or a small firm? Here's a good question. I mean, I, what's I the, think it, what am I gonna get? Well, I think it depends on what you're doing. Like, for example, you, Stephen, have a big firm representing you, but you've had a lot of conflict. You've had some litigation. You've had, you know, things go south on you. It's been tough. You've thank, had a tough road. Thank, you thanks for bringing that up, Damon. Oh. Thank, thank, oh. Thanks for bringing that up. But you've been wildly successful, right? <laughs> but well, you, need a, you need a big firm if you're going to go to battle. You've got to have a big firm. Um, but if you don't, if you do, if you're a sole inventor, man, you just you really don't need that to start out yeah. because the sole practitioners or the small boutique firms can do a terrific job for you and actually spend more time on your uh, patent because they have lower billing rates, they have you know fewer commitments in that area. So you know, I, I think you just look at what you're going to do if you're going to go to battle, go get a big go get a big firm. Yeah, I think you're right, and I and I knew when I was in the packaging in the you know industry and who I was dealing with. I kind of knew I, I was going to probably end up in court somewhere down here. Okay, yeah. so um, the firm that I started with happened to have their own litigation and all that kind of great stuff. So, well, um, and, and but, people don't understand that the, the the acquiring of patents and the enforcement of patents are two separate areas of law, completely yeah. separate. I can tell you this: uh, the the larger firms are very very expensive, and I'm not even quite sure. Some of those patent attorneys are actually writing it. I think someone else was writing it. So that's probably true. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's some really good things and other things that you just have to write. You have to question. But I think Damon's absolutely right. If you've got consumer products, and that's going to be going in and out, and you don't think you're ever going to be in court, and hopefully you're not, um, I would definitely go with an individual. No doubt about it. Um, plus, they're going to know you, and they're going to work. And you know, the guy that's working on. Right? I mean, okay. Well, um, here's the thing, Stephen. Here's my, my number one criteria for selecting an attorney, and I've had attorneys too. I've had a variety of actions that happened that I needed attorneys. I call them, call them up on, on the phone and talk to them, and if I can't talk to them like a human being and, and, and make them understand and they can repeat back to me what I've said or know that I, they understand me, they're gone. Because I, yeah. I, I can't afford to spend time with people who, who we can't communicate. So one of, my, one of the things I tell people is, Talk to them, and if you can understand them, you feel a rapport, that's a really good sign. If you don't feel that rapport, man, go on to the next guy. It's not going to hurt his feelings if you don't use him for you know your work. Now, it, it's almost like a marriage, isn't it, David? I mean, it feels like yeah. for as long as it takes, it's like... And it can so be a bad marriage. It can really be bad. You know, <laughs> but you're, you're going to be with your guy for five, six years, just on one yeah. patent. So yeah, no. it is a long-term relationship, and that it, you know, it, it does get strained at times. So... Pick wisely. There you go. All right, Damon, thank right. you very much. And uh, watch for the next one, you guys. It's going to be a good one. Thanks. Awesome.